How about we have church? been found nothing really feels the same I hold my head a bit higher I lift my voice a bit louder yeah something inside has changed I am a mountain mover water walker more than just an overcomer because I've been set free I am a gospel preacher heart on fire I'm saying testifier Cause I've been redeemed I'm a believer Oh yeah, how about you? Let's do some believing this morning in a brighter day I am a mountain mover water walker more than just an overcomer cause I've been set free I am a gospel preacher heart on fire freedom singing testifier cause I've been redeemed yeah I'm a believer oh yeah I believe Yeah, I'm a believer I am a child of the Father An orphan no longer No doubt about who I am I'm in the hands of the healer The arms of the Savior His grace makes me who Cause I've been set free I am a gospel preacher Heart on fire Freedom singing testifier Cause I've been redeemed I am a mountain mover Water walker More than just an overcomer Cause I've been set free I am a gospel preacher Heart on fire Freedom singing testifier Cause I've been redeemed I'm a believer Yeah I'm a believer
gospel preacher, heart on fire, freedom singing, testifier. Cause I've been redeemed. I am a mountain mover, water walker, more than just an overcomer. Cause I've been set free. I am a gospel preacher, heart on fire, freedom singing, testifier. Cause I've been redeemed I'm a believer Yeah Oh, it's good to be a believer Yeah, I'm a believer Yeah Oh, yeah Oh, oh, oh yeah Hallelujah Oh, yeah
important this morning. I thought so. The let God arise, let God arise, let God arise. And the more we sang it, the more powerful it, it felt. And I saw like cracks in the earth and um, like when you can see the spirit is not limited is what I'm trying to say. And it came up through those cracks. And I just, God, I love that part. Arise, arise, let God arise. And I, I wish we could all sing that in this place this morning, but I still see these chairs full of people and every single one of them shouting, let God arise. And maybe they were angels filling this place all singing the same thing. So I see a massive amount in this church this morning and they are all singing, arise, arise, let God arise. So wherever you are this morning, you can join in with us and sing, arise, arise, let God arise in this hour, in this time. What we are seeing is we are going to see that turn very shortly where God is just going to show up. Yes. And I believe that this morning. And there's something very special about today, this day, about arise, arise, let God arise. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you something because as we allow God to arise, his body, his bride is arising and looking bright in this world. For we are the light of the world. And I want to tell you something. It is not a time to be down. It is not a time to say, oh no, everything's not the same. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you, there is one that is the same. The same yesterday, today, and forever, and that is God Almighty, and He is rising up in His body. I'm here to receive the offering today, but I want to give you a report. I was looking at statistically, most churches in their offerings are down between 30 and 90% pretty terrible that people are that their churches are having such struggles so I want to give you the report on our church because somebody said well I know you guys are probably struggling actually truth reality we are getting in more funds than we have when we normally have church we are up in our finances and that's because of everybody doing their part it's incredible but most importantly it's a sign from God it's a sign from God for us that he is for us and not against us. And so I'm going to receive the offering. Uh, if you're watching by PayPal, you go to our website and donate. Come to our church building. Mail it in, 11913 Manal Boulevard Northeast, 87112. Or you can donate by PayPal. It's paypal.me front slash Glory Bound Ministries. Paypal.me front slash Glory Bound Ministries. Now, I'm going to pray over your offering right now and then we've got a report that we want to give you can give the testimony and Lisa wants to give the testimony so father in the name of Jesus I thank you for every offering I thank you for your multiplication most of all I thank you for your faithfulness you said you gave us seed to sow and as a seed is sown I proclaim a harvest in the holy name of Jesus that not only will this church never suffer financial need but not any person giving will ever suffer because you are our Lord our bread provider sustainer and Father, you said that you would never, no, never, no, never, no, never, no, never leave or forsake us, leave us without financial support. So I pray blessing, blessing, multiplication in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mary, you want to give a testimony? Yeah. And then Lisa, if you want to give a testimony. Yeah. Um, I just want to give a testimony. Uh, as you know, um, uh, our police department here in the city of Albuquerque has been pleased to report that not one policeman has been diagnosed with a case of uh, coronavirus. And so considering what the policemen have to do in the course of their day, um, that is a marvelous testimony. Also, in Rio Rancho, not one Rio Rancho policeman has been diagnosed with the coronavirus. So that's a beautiful testimony. I pray that the same is re is, could be said of our fire departments across our state. And, and soon, let it be said of every place in our state in the name of Jesus, amen. And I just wanted to say that uh, um, I'm a, an essential worker who's still working. And in our place, we have not one case of coronavirus. Because I declare and decree every time I walk through that door that Jesus is Lord. Amen. What about in New York? Oh, that's right. 
So I have a site that's here in Albuquerque, and we believe God for them, but also my uh, extension in New York, in Newark and Rochester, no coronavirus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God.
circumstances change, but his love, it never changes, never falls short, never comes to an end. Oh, your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Yeah.
Thank you, Jesus. Don't you love worshiping God? I love worshiping God, and I love worshiping God with everybody that's here and everybody that's watching. I think it's an important thing that we continue our fellowship with one another and our fellowship, of course, with the Father. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are the Almighty. You are our God. And Father, we know when we have a sense of something changing, something coming around now. Father, we've lived through some things, some trials, some tribulation. But you said that we are to be of good cheer, for you've overcome the world and deprived it of power to harm. And we know, Father, that you're bringing us to our greatest hour, our greatest time. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that the words that come forth now would be words of life. That, Father, you would take the scriptures, you would take the words that come, and you would just put them inside us in a way that changes us from one degree of your manifest presence to another degree. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, today we're going to talk about something, and I want you to pay attention. You know, sometimes we think, oh, yeah, I know all about that. My favorite thing I do with the Father God is he'll say, I want to talk to you about something. And I'll say, oh, yeah, I know about that. And uh, I find out that I don't know near as much as I thought. And he seems to know more than I do. So as we're talking today, I want you to try to grab hold of what God is saying. We're talking today about his perfect love and his love being perfected in us. And so I want this on the screens or if you've got the notes there. It says, during this time of quiet, and all of us are in the time of quiet, We've been separated from life as we knew it. We now have an opportunity to experience the, an aspect of God's love that will dispel fear and darkness. This is done for ourselves and for the people God is sending us to. And so there's a lot of things right now that are fearful. Anytime there's the unknown, it's a little scary. You know, if we've never been there, if we've never done that before, it's a little scary. But God's love is going to come in and we're going to receive what already is in such a way that it's going to dispel fear, terror, the things of the unknown. And so I want us to start out with very a scripture that we know very well. It's in 1 Corinthians 13. But I'm going to read it to you in the Passion Translation. And the reason I like to do different translations for me personally is sometimes I get too familiar with scripture and it doesn't have its oomph to it that it needs to. And so I want us to hear it maybe in a new way. So I'm going to start with 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4. It says, love is large and incredibly patient. Now, you know, the word of God says that God is love. So God is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle, consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about its own achievements, nor inflates its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily intimidated or quick to take an offense, irritated or quick to take an offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter. It never stops believing the best for others, Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away, more enduring than tongues, which one day will be silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial. But when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. This is one of the most important chapters that we could ever know because when we say God is love, we pretty much sometimes think, well, God puts up with us. Okay, we've done this and uh, God's made a commitment to us. But reality is he is pure love. Amen. And he says, I'm patient and I'm kind all the time and I never give up That's right. because I am pure love. And I like what it says, love doesn't traffic in shame or disrespect. I think some of the things that we've moved to, not only as a people, but as Christians. We've gotten off in an area where politically, we think that we need to discover what's wrong with the other party and blast it out there. However, love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, and it finds no delight in what is wrong. There's a lot of things wrong in this world, a lot. But for us to major on that, leaves the love walk very far away. 
When we love people, it's what changes the hearts of people. You're trying to win somebody to Jesus. It's not going to be by pointing out their faults. I don't know anybody that, oh, you see how horrible I am. I think I'll come to Jesus. But love breaks down, and man is not able to gainsay or resist the love of God. And so he tells us that when the complete and perfect comes, then in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, he said, until then, there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Yet love surpasses them all, so above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. In Christianity, we thought the prize for which you run is getting great giftings. If I can move in great gifts, then the world will see these great gifts, and they'll come. But God says, this is what I want, your beautiful prize, for you to go after with all that you are, I want it to be love. I thought about this because we know this one guy that is so kind and so loving, and we're going to have him as a speaker, a guest speaker. And I said, well, we can't advertise. This guy is loving and kind. You have, to, you have to advertise. He's powerful in miracles. He moves forth in this. But if we put down what God really wants as a priority is that we walk in love, and this man walks in love. You remember that a while back, there were people that would stand at a corner, and they were just, I'm giving free hugs. And they would have lines of people there to get a hug. Yes. Why? Because people long and are passionate. They, they want somebody to love them. I remember the first day after I received Jesus, waking up the next morning, and just felt enveloped by love. Somebody loved me and cared about me. And when somebody loves you and cares about you, there's no threat at all in the relationship. You could tell them anything. You could say anything. You know, I say terrible things, and Mary always says, oh, you just have a headache. <laughs> and I figured, I have chronic headaches because I'm always saying these things. But what she does is she's always trying to, no, that's not really who you are, always trying to remind me of that. And we look in the Bible and what Jesus did. There were people that were totally rejected, like the woman caught in adultery. She's brought, she needs to die. Look what she's done. Totally rejected. But Jesus loved her. And he loved her and forgave her. And it was the first time anybody had ever accepted her, ever. And he was able by doing that to say, now you can go and you don't ever have to sin again because somebody's loved and accepted you. When Mary and Martha were there and uh, Martha was serving Jesus and Mary was just at his feet, what was she doing? She was receiving the love from Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, I know you're working for me. And this still today is what happens in Christianity. We're the hard workers for God or we're the lovers of God. And if you're a lover of God, then you become a worker for God. But you can't work for God to try to get his love. I don't need to earn his love. He's given it to me totally and completely. And so Jesus is going to tell people about the love of God. And so he does something so weird. He takes what they knew as their scriptures. He takes something that they knew to be what is absolute truth. And he says, yeah, I know. Your, your word says that. Your scripture says that. But I'm telling you. And he gives something greater. Now, we would throw somebody out of the church if they said, I know it says that, but here's what God is saying. And it's not that God disagrees with his word ever, but there are time periods. And before Jesus came, the law was the one that was in action. It was what everybody was trying to do, even though all it was given for, the law was only given for one reason, to find out that we can't do it and we need a savior. And so here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. You're familiar with the old written law. Love your friend and its unwritten companion hates your enemy. And I am challenging that. I tell you, love your enemies. Let them bring the, out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. Yes. For then you're working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. Yeah. This is what God does. He gives his best. The sun to warm, the rain to nourish to everybody, regardless of the good, the bad, the nice, the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. Right. And if you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. 
Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. Wow. Well, wait a minute. This person has said this, or this political party is saying this, or this is what this person is doing. And it says, instead of letting that be where you point out the wrongs, any one of us can be detectors of the obvious. I know what wrongs are going on. But he says, let your enemies bring out the best in you. I am telling you that we have seen this actually happen. One time we were in uh, Mexico and we preached and after we'd finished preaching, we laid hands on people and people started getting filled with the Holy Spirit, including the pastor's daughter. And as soon as we were done, the pastor got up and he said, I know all this has happened, but I just want to tell you, I don't believe in what they did. And I thought, what are they going to do? Cough up the Holy Spirit? What are they going to do? And he said, so we're canceling their meetings from this time on. They're not, they were supposed to be here several days. We're going to cancel their meetings because one, she's a woman. And two, she's wearing jewelry. And three, they talked about the Holy Spirit in a way that we don't believe. They canceled our meetings. They were our enemies. They canceled our meetings. But no, we did something. We began to pray and bless them. The next day, somebody came and said, hey, I have a huge yard, many acres in my yard. Why don't we do an outdoor meeting? So we did an outdoor meeting. We set our stuff up. More people came to that outdoor meeting to see us, who the woman teaching and wearing jewelry and talking about the Holy Spirit this way. And somebody had accused us of drinking beer, which we weren't. They, they used beer bottles that they put this cream in that we used to drink. And so people wanted to come out and see the beer, the beer drinkers. We want to see these Christians that are beer drinkers. We want to see these Christians that do this. Turned out that our meetings were phenomenal. We were able to reach so many more outside of the church than in the church. So if you have enemies, God promises he's going to work all things together for good. He's going to turn it around. It's going to cause your prayer life to increase. And he said, stop just looking for people who like you to be nice to. Stop doing that. Right. Go after everybody. Amen. Everybody. Because after all, you know, when we look at the scriptures, we're not any run-of-the-mill sinner. <laughs> we're saved by Jesus Christ. And so he tells us to love generously. Be towards others the way God is towards you. I am telling you that sometimes we try to realize and say, well, you know, I did this. God doesn't love me anymore. Never happened. God didn't love you because you were so incredible. God loved you because he created you in me and loves you in me with all that he is. In fact, it tells us in Psalm 91, 14, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. He's talking about Jesus setting his love on him. I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name and has a personal knowledge of my mercy and loving kindness, trusts and relies on me, knowing that I will never forsake him. No, never. Now, we put our love on God, and God says, I'll never forsake you. I have given you a new heart of flesh, and I have given you the responsibility to respond to me. You know, when the Bible says that God has taken out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, what that means is he has given us a heart that's responsive to him. God's heart is always, always and already is responsive to you and me. But now we've been given a heart that's responsive to him. In Psalm 91, 14, in the Passion Bible, it says, For here is what the Lord has spoken to me. Because you have delighted in me as your great lover, I will greatly protect you. I will set you in a high place, safe and secure before my face. And so God says, when we keep him in a position of loving God, then God says, I will greatly protect you. Now, does that mean he's not going to protect anyone that doesn't love him? No. But it means when we have set our love there, we are open to receive God's protection, God's love for us. And God tells us that we're to love him. Love is so important. You know, I can do duty things for people. Yes, it's my duty that I call you. It's my duty that I do this. But if I'm motivated by love, you can't stop me from doing it. You can't stop me from wanting to give because I'm motivated by love. And so God says in Mark chapter 12, verse 33, and, love, and loving him with all passion, intelligence, and energy, and loving others as, you, as well as you love yourself. Why? It's better than all the offerings and sacrifices put together. We can do great and mighty works for God. And we can, and that's incredible. I love to watch the great miracles of God. But God said there's something greater. And that's it. You love me with all your passion, 
with everything that you are, not just, blah, 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 I love God, I love God. No, loving God where it drives you, and love is a real driving thing. I remember these people uh, said they kept trying to get their son to go to church. No, I'm not going to go. He's already 16. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. And they said, there's some real pretty girls at church. Okay, I'll be ready. <laughs> Motivated by the heart's desire. And so God tells us in Mark chapter 12, 33 in the Passion Bible, it says, and there's something more important to God than all, all the sacrifices and burnt offerings. It's the commandment to stay constantly loving God with every passion of your heart, with every thought, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor in the same, in the same way as you love yourself. That's interesting because it's three things. Love God. Love yourself and love your neighbor just like you love yourself. And so when we look at the word of God, he said, more than anything you do, I want you to love. And I'll tell you what attracts people to you is not your beauty outwardly, though you may be beautiful outwardly. It's not that that attracts them, but what attracts them is your deep and intense love where you love God. I know for me, with any minister I watch, when I see how much they love God, it drives me crazy. It really does. It makes me just pull into that. What? Because I want to see somebody that loves God so much. Because when they love God like that, they can't help but emulate him and love other people and love themselves. In Colossians 3.14, it says, regardless of whatever else you put on, wear love. I don't care if you're wearing your mask or your gloves. It says, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garments. Never be without it. So we put on love. It covers me. It's what I'm dressed in. It's what I'm reminded of. I'm reminded to be loving, to be kind. In Colossians 3.14 in the Passion, it says, For love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues. Love becomes the mark of true maturity. How you know somebody is mature in Jesus is not how well they, they can quote scripture. It's not how wonderful they are at knowing all the sacraments and all the things that we're supposed to do. But maturity, according to the word of God, is how much you love. Because love is what we read at the beginning. It's patient. It's kind. Yes. Doesn't seek its own way. Is always looking to be a blessing to other people. And it never gives up. Yes. Finds no delight in anything wrong. It says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. Above all things. Now, there are things, but now Peter has said above all things. Have an intense, unfailing love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sin, forgives, and disregards the offense of others. Now, I want you to remember this. Peter wrote this book after he had had his experience with leaving the ministry, Jesus calling him back to the ministry, then he wrote this book because Peter understood something. He understood that love comes in, and when love comes in, it didn't matter what sin he did. Denied Jesus three times, it didn't matter. He loved. Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, Peter, will you quit being an idiot and going off doing your own thing? He said, Peter, and he reminded Peter, you love me. And when you love me, you're going to give to other people. And Peter came in. So Peter's able to write this, not just that he's getting from the Spirit, but he has experienced Amen. the absolute love and being brought back to his first love. It says it this way in the Passion Bible. It says in uh, 1 Peter 4 8, above all, constantly echo God's intense love for one another. For love will be a canopy over a multitude of sin. Amen. Now, looking that up, it says, love acts like a roof. Storms will come, but they will not be allowed to harm anything in there because the roof is keeping it away. So what will happen is sin actions will come, different things will happen, but we're under the canopy of the love of God and it can't touch us and it can't harm us. And he says, and I want you to echo the intense love. I think what I miss so many times with people is intensity. I like intensity. God is intense, and he's intense with how much he loves us. And he says, now echo that. Let that be your intensity of how much you love me and love one another. 
and love yourself. Now, John, John had a different thing. John was the young man, disciple of Jesus. He was probably somewhere between 14 and 15 years old when he was laying against the very breast of Jesus and loving on Jesus. He was a young boy. He had not had heartbreak. He had not gone through divorces. He had not had all these things happen to him. He was open for love, but something happened to him. He had the time with Jesus, and then he got caught up, and he wrote the book of Revelation. He got caught up into heaven, and he saw heaven. And the first book he wrote was not the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The first book that he wrote was Revelation. And then he wrote J Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, with a reference to what he had experienced on earth with Jesus and what he saw in heaven. And so when you look at the books of John, they're all about love. When I have trouble with love, here's my punishment for me. Go read the books of John. Okay. And I read it, and then I remember who I am. And so in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, this is the kind of love that we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God ever, but if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. Perfect love, complete love of God is when we love God and love one another. And he says, it's not that we came up with the idea, oh, we once loved God. No, God loved us and loves us so we can intensely love him back. John 13 in verse 34, he says, so I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know you're my true followers. Now, we've come up with lots of plans of evangelism. We have. We did some great things years back. We'd go on Central and we'd make hot dogs and we'd preach the gospel. And we'd love all the people there. We'd help them. We'd minister to them. That was a great plan. But the main part of our plan was that we went and loved these people. And they were some strange people. I know you're watching now. But they were some interesting people, but we loved them. And God said, here's my plan of evangelism that you love one another. What? How is that evangelism that I love my brothers and sisters in Christ and I love my family? How's that evangelism? Because it says, in the heart of man is placed a sense of eternity. In every human being, That's right. there is eternity placed inside them. Where the person, why am I here? What am I doing? What, who created me? That is placed inside every human being. And when they see us loving each other, it draws them. It draws them. What is it that you guys have that you love one another? He didn't say that we just, just have some love, but that we love one another. But what have we done in the body of Christ? Let's separate. I don't like what they believe. Do you know what they said? Do you know how they are? I think we should not fellowship with them. I don't know why we're not drawing the world to us right now. But he says this is how by loving one another, then everyone will know that you are my true followers. In John 14, 21, it says, the person who knows my commandments and keeps them, that's who loves me. And the person who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and make myself plain to him. Having trouble understanding all the things of God? God says, listen, here's my commandment. Love me. Love yourself and love your neighbor. And when you obey these commandments that I've given you, I'm going to reveal myself to you. I, God reveals himself because he's love. And when I'm loving, then I'm in him. And he reveals himself. In John 14, 23, it says, Because a loveless world, said Jesus, is the sightless world. If anyone loves me, he will carefully keep my word and my father will love him and will move right into the neighborhood. This is pretty incredible because Jesus said, if you don't love, if somebody doesn't love, then they can't see anything. But when we love God, he moves right in with us. Where are you living? Hey, we live in the hood. You know, there's, there's Jesus right there with us. 
He's in our neighborhood. He's in our place. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, it says love. You know how many scriptures there are on love in the Bible? There are hundreds of scriptures on love in the Bible. But we want to concentrate on the scriptures that talk about miracle, that talk about something that appeases us. But this is what is for God. Yes. He talks about it all the time. He says to, uh, he says in John, uh, in Romans chapter 12, 10, love one another with a brotherly affection as members of one family, giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Actually seeing somebody as before me, actually being more interested in you than I am in me, actually wanting to help you more than I want you to help me. Many times when people are seeking out relationships, they're looking for, what can you do for me? But God says, we need to seek out relationships of what can I do for you? And God says that this is showing honor to one another by giving precedence. Amen. This is what the body of Christ is, to love God and love one another. Romans 13, 10, love makes it impossible to harm another, yes. so love fulfills all that the law requires. See, before they used to have to have all the different rules that they had, I'm telling you, the people that came in today, they didn't have to hide their wallets from me. They didn't. They might even know that I had a financial need, but they didn't have to hide their wallets. Why? Because I love, you love, and we do, we do not do harm to one another. We're not looking to do each other in. We're looking to help one another. 1 Corinthians 14.1, because remember, he says, make this the prize you're going for. And in 1 Corinthians 14.1, it says, eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your great quest. Amen. Earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual endowments, the gifts, especially that you might prophesy, interpret the divine will and purpose in inspired preaching and teaching. Amen. Eagerly pursue. Make it your great quest. We always watch movies where they have a quest to find something. Even if it's a person that's been missing, oh, this is my quest. And God says, here's your quest. Find this love. Pursue this love. Make it your aim and your great quest. What if as a body, as a church, as the body of Christ, everybody had one goal and one goal only, and that was to love? What a church we'd have. It'd be packed because people would come from all over, not just to get a hug from someone in a line, but to really be loved, to really have that. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let everything you do be done in love, true love to God and to man as inspired by God's love for us. What if you let everything, what if I let everything I do be in love? I guess I wouldn't do that many things. <laughs> no, let everything we do be out of a motivation of love and how we can intensely help somebody, see somebody else, everything that we do. Whether we uh, go to the store, whether we are home, whether we are praying, everything we do be done in love. But there's only way, one way to do this. When I find myself critical of people, when I find myself nagging at something, it's because I'm not receiving the love from God. I can't give what I'm not receiving. And so my job, First and foremost is to receive he who first loved me so that I can then echo for myself and for the people I minister the intense love by which God has loved me. And so if you're finding that faults are thick and love is thin, then it's important to get with love so that you can find it being the exact opposite. He tells us that uh, 2 Corinthians 5.14, Christ's love has moved me to such extremes his love has the first and the last word in everything we do. Our firm decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. Amen. Here was Paul. He was a guy that was the chief of Pharisees. He was the guy that positioned, that worked hard for God. And now he's been given a position of the great apostle. And what does he say? He says, look, we're all on equal level here. We're all just the same because I, have, I know this, that God has the first and the last word in love of everything we do. So I want you to think about where you're working or at home. What could you do that would have the first and the last word of love and love being the motivation of everything? Not tired of cooking. 
tired of this. I'm tired of sleeping. It's just 18 hours a night is not enough. And so we look and we think we need to work from a focus center that Jesus Christ died and resurrected. And because of that, we have been born again into absolute love. In 2 Corinthians 5, 4, it says, uh, I'm sorry, in Galatians 5, 6, it says, for Christ, in Christ, neither our conscious religion, our conscientious religion, nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. For what matters is something far more interior, faith expressed by love. And so we could say, I have faith to move mountains. I have faith to this extreme. And it says, yeah, that's great. You can even speak in tongues of men and of angels, but if you don't have love, it's nothing. And he says, what's powerful is when your faith is motivated by love. Amen. I'm believing for this because I love God's word. I love what he has said, and I love this person. Not watch what I can do, but motivated out of love. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you'll be empowered to discover whatever Holy One experiences, the great multitude of astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply, intimately, far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. The fullness of God dwells in us, but because he is love, that means the fullness of love dwells in you and me. And we can use our faith, and it says, and Christ will continually be released on the inside of us. And so I think we need to ask, why am I doing this? Why am I in position? Why am I teaching? Why am I cleaning? Why am I doing this? Am I doing this to gain man's approval? Am I doing this to gain some sort of self-esteem? Or am I doing this because I love and I can't help telling what I've seen and heard? Or am I doing this because I love and I want to express the love of God and I want people to experience that? tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, and remember who John is, the one who started so young and the one who experienced the book of Revelation right in front of him while in heaven and came back and wrote these things. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, perfect, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors expels every trace of terror, for fear brings with it the thought of punishment. So he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. This is an amazing thing. It says that if I am mature in love, then I am not afraid of this horrible judgment or punishment that everybody says is going to happen. You know why that happened to you. God's judging you. I went to a church that believed that everything we did, God, I was under the judgment of God. But the judgment of God came on Jesus. Jesus was judged so that I could be set free of judgment. And you think about it. The person who loves you, that you know loves you, you're not afraid. You're not afraid to tell them when you've done something wrong. You're not afraid you're going to be punished by them. Why? Because they love you. And love makes you not afraid. And you are mature in the things of God when you are mature in love. I don't feel like punishing anybody. I know recently there was a group of people that came against this one minister. And they had the punishment for the minister. Because they had found that he had done wrong. It didn't matter if they gave him an opportunity to respond or not. They had found it and they were going to punish him. Because they were right. Except for they didn't have perfect love except for they didn't have any love, but they were in position. And we did a conference about it, and then we did days and days so that we could know how bad this minister was. And you know what that did for that minister? It just brought him right in. He just, yeah. oh, the kindness and the love. I can hardly wait to be around these people. No. No, it didn't. But what would have been the better move? 
is to love him and become that ceiling for him. Not covering up sin, but loving him regardless of sin. That's the way Jesus does. The reason we're not mature in the things of God is we're not mature in love. And we're not drawing the world in because they're already judging themselves and being judged. Why do they come to church to be judged? They already know that. But they come to church so that they can be loved. Amen. So first John chapter 4 and verse 18 in the Passion Bible, it says, Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. Wait till your father gets home. But love's perfect perfection drives fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. We're not going to be punished by God. Jesus took that punishment. I don't need to punish somebody so that they'll learn their lesson. I need to love them through it. What it's like when someone loves you even when you've done something horrible. It's God's goodness. Yes. It's God's kindness that leads men to repentance. Amen. It's God loving us. Amen. God loving us. He does everything out of who he is. In Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, it says, God wasn't attracted to you and didn't choose you because you were big and important. The fact is, there was almost nothing to you. He did it out of sheer love, Amen. keeping the promise he made to your ancestors. He stepped in and mightily brought you back out of the world of slavery, fed you from the, uh, freed you from the iron grip of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know this, God is your God, is God indeed a God you can depend on. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for a thousand generations. Amen. His covenant of love, loyal love, sheer love. Hey, I thought he kind of liked me because I do this and I do that. And one time God said, I love you no matter what. And I said, yeah, you kind of have to, you know, that's who you are. And he said, and I am proud of you no matter what. And I said, yeah, I teach and I do this. He said, no. I would be proud of you if you never taught another day of your life. And I would be proud and love you if you never did one more thing for me. Amen. That blew my mind. I thought you like me because I do. No, he loves us because of who he's made us to be. He's created us, recreated us in Christ, and loves us. Look at this. I love the way it's written here. Psalm 23, 6. Your beauty and your love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Do you realize God's chasing after us? Goodness and mercy and loving kindness are always chasing after me. But I like the way this puts that. His love chases after me every day of my life. I want to let it catch me. How about you? I really do. Because I've forgotten sometimes. It's about his love. We're in this position right now with everything going on where we're saying, just tell us what's the next step. How are we to raise up? What are we to do? And God says, love me. Let me love you. And then I'll reveal to you all things. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 21. Handing out life to those who love me, filling their arms with life, armloads of life. Guess what I get to get? Life, 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 and more life just by allowing God to love me and me loving him. Song of Solomon 2.4 says, He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. A love waved as protecting and comforting banner over my head when I was near him. His love over me is protecting. God will not ever, ever forsake us ever because we're the apple of his eye. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that your heart is filled with him? God loves us. And the Bible says in order to satisfy the deep and intense love with which he loved us, he sent Christ Jesus. He loves us with an intensity. And he gave us everything. In John 3.16, it says, For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift so that now everyone who believes in him will never perish but experience ha, everlasting life. 
God did not send his son in the world to judge and condemn the world. He left it to us. But it's the sa to be its savior and rescue us. We're not to judge. Jesus did not come to judge and condemn, but to give us life, eternal life. Why? Because God loved. And he didn't want to lose that which he loves with everything that he is. Jesus, when praying before going to the cross in John 17, and this, this should astound us, what he says. He says, you, he's praying to the Father. He says, you live fully in me, and now I live fully in them, so that they will experience perfect unity, and the world will be convinced that you have sent me. For they will see that you have loved each of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. Now, two things. He says, Father, that the world will see their unity, their love that they have, and they'll be convinced that I have come. How's the world convinced Jesus came? How much we love each other. That's right. And then he says, and Father, you love them. I, I get this. God, you love me with the same intensity, with every bit of as much commitment of love that you loved your very own son, Jesus. We know that God loved Jesus. I mean, Jesus has a problem. Here's the answer. Jesus needs something. Here I am. But God said, I love you in that same intense way that I love my son. Pretty incredible, huh? Because we don't feel worthy of his love, and we feel he loves us when we do good, doesn't like us so well when we do bad. No. He loves us all the time. And if we are assured of his love, we are assured that whatever we ask, it's ours because he loves us. Romans 8 and verse 37. Even in the midst of all these things, they're talking about all these trials and tribulations, we triumph over them all for God has made us to be more than conquerors and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. Grab it. God's going to demonstrate his love for us during this time. And we're going to see more than conquerors, every one of us. His demonstrated love. How is, how is he going to demonstrate his love? Delivering us. Giving us the, the uh, knowledge and the wisdom to go forward. Amen. He's going to demonstrate his love during this time because he has promised that we are more than conquerors. Ephesians 2.4. Instead, immense in mercy with an incredible love. He's embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did this all on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Because of this immense love, he took our lives when we weren't nice, when we were in sin, when we were in rebellion, when we hated God, he took our lives and he loved us through it. And he brought us into the highest heaven with him. I love this scripture, Ephesians 5, 2. Mostly what God does is judge you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I misread that? Yes. Oh, mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn the life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. Yes. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. You and I have the capacity to love like that? Yeah, we do. Keep company with him so we can see how he loves and we can echo that. Ephesians 2, 5 in the Passion Bible. And continue to walk and surrender to the extravagant love of Christ. For he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for us. His great love for us was pleasing to God like an aroma of adoration a sweet, healing fragrance. Extravagant love. Didn't just love me in word, but in action and deed. Didn't just love me once in a while, but extravagant in his love. Gave himself for people that didn't want him. He loved them. He came to this world not to judge, but to love and to give himself. In Romans 8, 28, and we are assured yes. and know that God being a partner in our labor, that all things work together are fitting into a plan for good for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. 
we love God. And everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to work out better. Everything is going to work out to our good. It's the truth. Ephesians 4.15, God wanted us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other, his very breath and his blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we grow up healthy in God, robust in love. I have the heart that he's placed in me. A heart of flesh that's responsive to him. I have his very spirit, the very Holy Spirit within me. I have his blood flowing through me and his very breath flowing through me. And he is love and therefore we are love. And we can say, Claudia is patient and kind. Is never envious or boils over with jealousy. We can take the love chapter and put God's name in it and put our own name in it. Because it's who he created us to be. And how do we grow up? By walking and moving and, and knowing and being in love. That's how we grow up. You can have someone who's come to Jesus just a couple of months. And they're more mature than many Christians who have not walked in the fullness of love. Colossians 1.13. He's rescued us completely. From the rule, the, the rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. So I once was in darkness. I once was darkness. But now I am light. Because I've been translocated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the son of his love. I've been translated into the kingdom of love. I've been translated into that because that's the kingdom that I serve. The kingdom of love. Colossians 2, 2. And I'm contending for you that your hearts will be wrapped in the comfort of heaven and woven together into love's fabric. This will give you access to all the riches of God as you experience the revelation of God's great mystery, Christ. What's going to wrap us in the things of God? What's going to comfort us in the things of God? What's going to weave us into him? Is love. And so today, what I want you to experience, just take some time, even where you're at, and God, let your love come upon me. Mm -hmm. I sometimes forget how much you love me. And I forget how much you have released me because you love me with an intensity and an extravagant love. And I receive your absolute acceptance and absolute love and you're for me and not against me. And you're satisfying your deep and intense love. And your love is perfected in me. And Father, Holy Spirit, I am asking you to help me move in the fullness of who I really am. Echoing the Father in his love. Let it come upon me. Let me be who I really am. Love. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Mary? Amen. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that was awesome. I hope that you will go over those scriptures again in your heart and uh, let them really sink in because what you heard was the heart of God today because it really is about love. And I felt like... Um, I felt like the, the one thing that the Lord would ask me to say to us all today is, um, is don't be afraid of what's going to come up next in the world. Because if you believe that I love you, then you know that I have good planned. For a long time, um, many prophetic people have been saying, there's a new thing coming, there's a new thing, it's gonna be a new day, and we've all rejoiced at that because we wanted, we thought we wanted something new. And now that um, our normal life seems a little bit threatened, what we used to do, we're looking backwards to regain what was in the past. Don't do it. There is a new thing coming. And its foundation is the love of God. And it is for us, the church, 
and it's for the church to administer to the people of this world. It will change things, and you will have an opportunity to, um, you know how in that room over there we have the pictures of men and women who've gone before us and did mighty exploits in the name of Jesus, and we admire and respect them. Well, if they were here physically in this room today, they tell us to get over that that it's time for us to admire and respect the finished work of Jesus in our lives as they did, and that empowered by God's love, we could excel even the works of John G. Lake who held a virus in his hand and cursed it and it died. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so new things are going to come and you're gonna to get to experience some of these new things, but they are founded on the word of God, and they are founded on the great love God has for us and the love we get to give to other people. And, and if you hear a word from God and somebody tells you God said this, let me give you a big tip, please receive it. And there is fear that comes through that word that word did not come from God. That's right. Do you hear me? Yes. It, it could be an accurate word, being right, but if it is not filtered through the heart of the Holy Ghost, if it is not filtered through the heart of a loving Father, it did not come from the Father. Because if God has something hard to say to you, he'll tell you but you will not walk away feeling damaged or afraid for your life as a result. Even if he had to warn you about your life, even if he had to say, don't do that anymore, you still would know that you weren't abandoned and that God was with you That's to right. see you through. So please, don't accept any false, um, any false things that have the roaring sound of what we think God says, but has no love in it, did not come from God. And that's how you'll know the difference. That's how the Holy Spirit will help you discern the difference between God's voice and, and, a and a, someone's nice opinion, okay? I tell you this because so much goes on in the course of our days here, especially with what the current events are in our society but we asked God to do a new thing. And he is. But it will not be for our hurt or injury. It will be for good, and it will be for us to be instruments of love to a world who desperately needs to know that they're not by themselves, and that God cares for them, and he's not mad at them. Remember what Claudia read in John chapter 17, it says, this unity that the world will see, they'll know it because of the love that they see in us for each other and for the world. They'll know the difference. My friends, they're waiting to see the difference. These may be scary times, but later when we think about them, we'll say, these were some of the best days of my life because I drew a closer bond with the Heavenly Father and I was able to minister the love of God to people I thought I'd never get an opportunity to minister to, okay? So I'm embracing the new thing. I know there's gonna be a new normal and I'm okay with that because they trust God and love Him and He loves us back, right? Amen. I only have a couple of things today. Um, one is for Amy, and I know she's probably not watching because you said she, she was at work, but Amy, I want to tell you something. For a long time when I would see you, I would always see a, you holding an umbrella because a dark cloud was trying to rain down on you. And so you put up a protection of that umbrella. The Lord said, today, I'm removing that umbrella from your hand because the light is shining over you. And you don't need the past protections that you put over yourself anymore. You're free from that because the former things really, Amy, have passed away and behold, the fresh and the new has come. 
And so there is the heavenly light of God that shines on you wherever you go. And if no one can remember your past, then neither should you. Because you're brand new in Christ Jesus. And there are endless possibilities for good for you to walk into, okay? And then the other one is for someone named Jacob. Jacob, I see you. Um, I know that you're in the medical profession, and I just want to tell you you've had a great loss. But I'm telling you this, that no man has given up father, mother, sister, brother, houses for me that will not get double, will not get a return. So Jacob, I'm speaking return for you of what's been lost in Jesus' name. And I'm speaking return to you for what you have had to settle with um, in your heart because of circumstances. Raise your standards, my brother. Raise them up because God has good prepared for you. And you can walk in that right in the midst of where you are right now. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I want us to, we, we've gotten some... Um, it's okay to pray for Heidi and Roland, right? Yeah. Okay, we've, we've gotten um, some information about um, Heidi and Roland that they're, they're, they don't have enough food and people are, are starving. They're very hungry. Because so Because of the refugees coming in, because I don't know if you've seen, but in Africa where they've been growing some crops, locusts have come <laughs> and they have destroyed the crops and eaten them down to the nubs. And so there is, a, there is a, um, a lack of food in the continent of Africa right now. So if you're out there listening to us, please join in with us in prayer right now as we pray in Jesus' name. Jesus did so many miracles uh, with food. Yeah. <laughs> so in the name of Jesus, we speak to the nation of Mozambique and all the surrounding countries. We speak to the continent of Africa that there will be no lack of good things to eat in the name of Jesus Christ, but there will be a miracle of food being multiplied over and over again until everyone has everything that they need in Jesus' name. And we speak and we send a blessing to the soil in Jesus' name. We call for every seed that has been planted to reproduce a thousandfold in Jesus' name. Locusts, you're dismissed in Jesus' name. You cannot stay. You die in the name of Jesus. We just speak a refreshment um, in the hearts of the people of Africa. We speak a refreshment and protection over Mozambique and over the ministry of Heidi and Roland Baker there in the name of Jesus. We speak perfect health and healing for them in Jesus' name, and let this be a beginning of new things for them today, in Jesus' name, yes. amen. Is there anything else? Ah. Don't forget intercessory prayer. Um, it's going to be Tuesday at seven o'clock. It's a conference call. Call the first number, 712-775-7031, and then put in the code, and don't forget the hashtag, because sometimes you do, and Wyatt has something to say. Yeah, just a couple of things to kind of keep us uh, in touch. Remember that if you want to receive the church bulletin, or if you just want to connect with the church, giving us your name, your address, everything like that, um, we want you to do that on our email at glorybound.min, G-L-O-R-Y-B-O-U-N-D-M-I-N, no caps, no spaces, glorybound.min at aol.com. That way we can send you by email the church bulletin when Claudia was talking about everybody being generous with the church and, and uh, our finances have not suffered during this time of, uh, of, of, of non-participation personally here in the church. Um, the church bulletin talks about that. You know, we have our financial report every week and everything, so you can kind of keep up on things. Um, we also want to make mention that today, this uh, 
this is Sunday, the 26th. Just I'm saying that just in case somebody uh, sees this broadcast in days future. Today, starting at 11.15 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, uh, from 11.15 to 1 p.m., we're doing a bit of a food drive right here. Um, Dean and Linda Curtis, two of our elders, are heading up a food drive. They're working with some families in, in Chinle, Arizona, um, to, to, to raise up some, some food staples and stuff for some people in the Navajo Nation. Now, um, as you might know, the coronavirus has hit the Navajo Nation really hard. And, and uh, we're praying for that. We're standing with them and for them. One of the ways that they can stay in place better is if we can raise up these foodstuffs to kind of help them. Um, so, so we're going to be working with some families in Chinle, Arizona to raise up uh, some food. So even right now, if you're in Albuquerque or close by, you can kind of pack the car, get some stuff, and 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 come here to the church by one o'clock. We will we we will maintain a, a personal separation. You won't even have to unload your car. We'll have somebody unload your car for you and 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 take these foodstuffs in, so you won't have to expose yourself to anybody as 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 you're distancing and staying in place and all that kind of stuff. But we're we're looking for. Uh, uh, we're looking for food, uh, non-perishable, uh, canned food, stuff like that. We don't want to collect water because that's very heavy and, and bulky and water's not the problem for the families that these guys are working with. But non-perishable or canned food items would be very good. Cash would be very good too because they can take your cash and they can buy some of the things they need on the way out there. So uh, uh, if, like I say, between 11.15 a.m. and 1 p.m. here at the church, Glory Bound Ministries, 11913 Manal Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, we're going to do this little bit of a food drive just to kind of help boost these families and everything. So stay in touch. Call one another up on the phone. Send each other emails. Do FaceTime. Check up on everybody. Love everybody. Make sure everybody's doing well. And uh, continue to participate with the church on Facebook as well as online. And let's let's get through this thing together. So far, we are still um, restricting personal uh, contact here in the church until at least April or May 15th. That's the date here in New Mexico where uh, we're kind of under orders to stay in place. Uh, at, at Once May 15th comes, we're hoping that some of these things get released and that we can get together again somehow, some way. But let's stay in communication up until then so that we know what we're doing, okay? God bless you. We're going to make it through this thing. Huh? Healing in the, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we're going to do the healing for the incurable meeting on Saturday. Um, what is the date Saturday? The second? Saturday, May 2nd at 10 o'clock a.m. We're going to do it on uh, the internet as well as on our website. Tune in and uh, we'll make the connection and healing will come in Jesus' name. We believe in healing. We're standing for healing. Just because we're not getting together one-on-one -on -one does not believe that we don't believe in the power of healing. We do believe in the power of healing. We do believe in the spoken word, the, the, the laying on of hands, miracles. We believe in, in, in healing by faith and we're going to exercise all of that on Saturday. Saturday, May the 2nd, 10 a.m. at the Healing for the Incurable meeting. Be sure and tune in for that. God bless you. We'll see you soon.
in the desert, floods in the plains. Let your mercy fall down like rain. Let your mercy fall down like 